Please take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Genesis. Going to be looking this morning at Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. And in whatever way you've got God's Word with you this morning, whether uh, the Bible that you brought or the pew Bible there in front of you or on a phone or mobile device, in whatever way you've got God's Word with you today, please find Genesis 8, 20 through, 20 through 22, and then keep that passage open during the message today. Genesis 8, verses 20 through 22. I'm, begin, or I'm continuing uh, the series of sermons from the story of Noah in the Bible and with our theme of rising above. Um, as you're finding that uh, uh, passage, Genesis chapter 8, uh, let me uh, just say a word uh, to you as a church family, um, a, a word of appreciation and a word of recognition. Remembering where the idea of Memorial Day comes from originally. A time to remember particularly those who have given their lives in sacrifice for our country. Uh, And so I I do want to ask, if you are in worship today, and if you are the family member of a deceased veteran, if you are the family member of a deceased veteran, would you please stand at this time? Family member of a deceased veteran. All right, all right. Uh, and, and I'm going to ask that you please remain standing again as we, as we thank you, as we thank you as families for the sacrifice of your loved one. Also, to simply recognize Families of those who are currently serving in the armed forces, if you've got a family member currently serving, if you would please stand at this time. Family member currently serving. All right. And then any in worship today, if you are currently serving, if you are currently serving either active duty or in the reserves, if you would please stand at this time. Anyone currently serving? All right. Let's pray. Father, In particular, we thank you for the sacrifice of these who gave their lives, even for this freedom that we are being blessed with right now, the freedom to worship you, to worship you without compulsion, to worship you with with, with no worry about what would be the circumstance later. God, we are mindful that even if these strictures were in place, Lord, we believe that we still would be worshiping you as many people around the globe are even this morning, maybe in a house church or a secret church. But God, we can stand before you boldly today without hindrance and say, you are our God and we love you. God, thank you that we live in a country that has enshrined this freedom and even is based upon this freedom of worshiping you. And Lord, I also want these families to know how much we value the sacrifice of their loved one in whatever field of battle that might have been, in whatever circumstance that might have been. Lord, these are ones who have given their all, and we are mindful of the words of our Savior who said, greater love has no one than this when he is willing to lay down his life in sacrifice for his brothers. Lord, Again, we are honored to be in worship together today to remember this sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. You know, this idea of sacrifice, this idea of giving our all is something that is definitely a theme that we find in this next event in the story of Noah. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. You follow along in your Bibles as I read aloud. Genesis 8. 20 through, 20 through 22. Now, let me, let me set the setting for you here. Uh, Noah and his family have come out of the ark. The flood waters have receded. We saw last week where Noah sent out those birds, right? First the raven, then the dove, and it was Noah's way of finding out that now there is dry ground. And so the doors of that ark are open, the animals leave, and then finally Noah and his family disembark from the ark. And notice then what Noah does. Genesis 8, 20 through 22. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took some from every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, 
The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You know, I, I can't help but think what I would do first coming off that ark. And we, we've talked about this. They've been in the ark for 11 months. From when the rain began to fall, they go into the ark, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and then all the animals. And again, when you read the, the Bible passage clearly, it simply says not just one pair, but seven pairs of animals brought onto the ark with, Mo, with, with I keep saying, I keep wanting to say Moses. Noah, Noah. Of course, Moses was in an ark as well, you realize that. The, 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 little, the little basket that, that, that Moses' family made for him, the very same word for Noah's ark is used for that little basket that they placed Moses in. So if I get mixed up, you'll understand the reason why. But when Noah and his family come off of the ark, think about what you would do. I'm thinking about what I would do, right? Breathe the fresh air for once. We finally get some peace and quiet. Man, that ark was messy and noisy. We're finally out. We're finally free. I haven't been on dry ground for 11 months. I think I'll walk around a little bit. But instead, what does Noah do? He builds an altar, and he worships. Now listen, I'm going to talk to you about worship this morning. And in talking with you about worship, I mean something far more than simply something that we schedule in the weekly church calendar. I'm talking to you about, a worship, about worship as part of your Christian life. Worship as part of your expression to the Lord. Worship as a part of your walk with the Lord. As a church, we say that the three most important things to us are worship, community, and mission. More than something we schedule, it's something that we do. Worship is a lifestyle. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And Noah is an amazing model for what this means. But here's what I want to say to you. Listen. It's worship that reveals your heart. In, in the whole Noah story, the word heart is mentioned so often. God's heart is broken. God says in his heart he will never again destroy the earth in this way. God knows that in his heart, for the human race, every inclination of our heart is only evil all the time. So much of the heart is mentioned in the Noah story. And let's be frank, much of it is negative. But then you've got this beautiful picture of the heart at times that are so very positive. And here you see it with Noah. When the heart is revealed. You know, we, we know each of us has a heart, but I'm not talking about a muscle that pumps blood. I'm talking about the heart as the seat of who you are, the seat of your desires, what you do and why you do it, your motivation, what's in here. You know, I'll never forget when Sarah was pregnant with Matthew. First child, right, and, and all the things that happened with, with first-time parents, I will never forget when Sarah went in for that first ultrasound, right? Parents, you remember this. And remember, when, when, when you begin to see this, th this image on a screen, and you're not really sure what it is at first. It's just kind of a, a, a thing on the screen, and then you begin to realize, you know what? That's our baby. But it's one thing to see it. But parents, remember what that felt like to hear that beating heart. And that's when it becomes real. I can see this, but to hear the heart as the heart begins to be revealed, that's an experience like no other. But I'm telling you this morning, when you engage in worship, when you do worship, whether it's in a setting like this or whether it's in your, your private prayer time or whenever you, you choose to worship God, listen, your heart is being revealed. And I want to show you what was so special about Noah's experience 
and just see what our worship is revealing about our hearts today. So with Noah, we are rising above. And remember this, when we talk about worship, we rise above when we worship. But in particular, understand what worship reveals about our hearts. And I want to show you a couple things about Noah's experience and some things that Noah's worship revealed about his heart. First of all, what does worship reveal about our hearts? Worship reveals our love for God. That's one of the things that's in our hearts. It's the love that we have. So see how this was true for Noah. And again, understand the setting here. They're getting off of the ark. The first thing that they do, and what does Noah do in verse 20? Look at this. Genesis 8, verse 20. Noah built an altar to the Lord. And he took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, here's what I want you to get about this. Noah is so good about following instructions, right? But that's the great thing about Noah. God says, build the ark. Noah builds the ark. God says, here are the measurements for the ark, down to the cubit. And the beautiful way the Bible tells Noah's story, it simply says, Noah did everything that God commanded. He built the ark exactly to God's specifications. Regardless of, uh, of the talk, the slander, the misunderstood glances that Noah must have gotten from the people around him, before there was a cloud in the sky, before the first raindrop fell, Noah was building the ark exactly as God commanded. And then as the flood came, what did Noah do? Exactly as God said. Brought the animals in the ark, took his family, made sure everybody was in, and then God himself shut the door. Noah is the poster child for doing what God says. And that's great. We love that. God says it, I'll do it. But Noah is not told to do what he does in verse 20. There is no record of God saying, now Noah, when the floods receded, and when you know about it, when, when, you know, when, when the dove comes back with the olive branch, and then when the dove doesn't come back at all, when you know that there's dry ground, and when you finally realize you can get off the ark, this is the first thing I want you to do, Build an offer, build an altar and offer a sack. There's no record of this. No, it just doesn't. It's free will. <laughs> it's spontaneous. He does it not because he has to. He does it because he wants to. And here you see the love that Noah has for God so freely revealed and so unmistakably displayed. And isn't that one indication of love? When we do something for someone else, not because we have to, but because we want to. You know, it's one thing to be in relationship, and I get this, you know. Please do this. Okay, I'll do it. I need you to do it. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. But listen, nothing shows love more than doing something when you're not asked. And, ima and, and imagine how you can bowl somebody over when you do something that's not even expected. It reveals love. It reveals the affection. It reveals the emotional warmth and connection that you have with another person. You do something not because you have to, but you do something because you want to. And this is exactly what Noah does. Now, there were altars built, you know. Back in Cain and Abel's day, there were offerings that were made. But listen, as of yet, there weren't really any special instructions about this. That would come later. In all the laws through Moses, there would be lots of specified things about what to do and how to do it and what animals to offer and what animals not to offer. All that comes later. Noah simply does something because he wants to. This is an expression of his heart. He has to do this because what? He loves God so much. Put yourself in Noah's shoes. Man, listen. God saved his life. God, you saved my life. I'm here with my wife and my kids and their wives. We're here. We made it. We're still alive. And we got a whole big old world in front of us that's been cleansed and made new. All sorts of possibilities and expectations. And God, I get to be a part of it? He can't help but lift up his praise and his glory and his honor to the Lord. He does this so spontaneously and so freely. It expresses his love for God. And if you think about it that way, it's like, you know what, Noah? I get it, and I understand it. He's going off the map here, 
but he can't help himself. He loves God so much. And he's offering praise to God. He's offering thanksgiving to the Lord. And he's doing something to express and show this to the Lord. Now listen, there are all sorts of ways to show God that we love him. We show him we love him by our obedience, by our serving, by our doing, what we do with our hands and our feet. These are all ways to show that we love God. But my fear is so often we think, well, if we're worshiping, that's not really doing anything. We do stuff later, and it's the stuff that we do, that's what really counts. But I think if we're honest, sometimes, sometimes, we do things because of what it will do for us. Others will see me doing this. They will notice me acting or serving in this way. But listen, when you worship, it's only to God if it's worshiping in truth. Only he is the one that receives your praise and adoration. And everything else that you do in life flows into and is a consequence of that. But listen, never underestimate the power of simply offering up to God adoration and praise and thanksgiving, and you simply say, God, you saved my life. Look at all the blessings you've given me, Lord. Home and family meaningful work and jobs and relationships and a hope and an expectation and a future. All of this you've given to me, God, and I love you for it. Worship reveals our hearts. John chapter 12, there's another story that relates to this. In John chapter 12, Jesus is, is, uh, is uh, reclining at table with, with, with some people, and a woman comes in. You know the story. A woman comes in, and she does something that, that is off the map. She does something that nobody expects and nobody really knows what to do with. She, she takes this expensive container of, of, of expensive perfume, she breaks it, and she anoints Jesus with it. She pours it over his head. And nobody knows what to do with it. They're, they're talking about her. They're saying, what, what is she doing? And, and, and we, we hear she's a woman of ill repute, and why is Jesus allowing her to do this? What's going on here? She could have sold that expensive ointment And how many people could we have served? How many homes could we have built? How many mouths could we have fed if we had simply sold what she gave? And she's wasted it. She's wasted it. And what does Jesus say in John 12? He says to all her detractors, y'all just hush, okay? Just hush. She has done a beautiful thing, and it will not be taken from her. What has she done? She's been overtaken by love and adoration to her Savior, and she anoints him. And she allows Jesus to experience something that nobody else was going to do for him. If you stop and think about it, Jesus' body was never anointed except for what this woman did, because remember, when those women showed up on, uh, on, on the first day, the third day after Jesus had died, they showed up to anoint his body, Right? But of course he had risen, he was gone, he was no longer in the grave. So when the woman showed up to anoint his body, she was doing something for Jesus that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Expressing adoration and love extravagantly, this is what worship is, this is what praise is, and this is showing love for God, not because we have to, not because we're expected to, but because we want to. Worship reveals the love that we have for God. But then there's something else that worship reveals in our hearts. It also reveals the devotion that we have for God. Could y'all just go ahead and advance that for me, please? All right, there it comes. There it is, all right, excellent. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Worship secondly reveals our devotion to God. Now notice how this is true for Moses. Now take a look. Look at verse 20. Noah built an altar to the Lord, took some of every clean animal, some of every clean bird, end of verse 20, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. Now again, Noah's doing something that there there really weren't instructions for this yet. This would come later. But what is he doing? He's taking animals, and he's putting them on an altar, and he's setting them on fire. And as these offerings are being consumed with this fire, what happens? That smoke and that aroma arises to the Lord. Now listen, when the Bible says that God smells the pleasing aroma, this simply means that God is pleased 
with Noah's worship. He is pleased with Noah's sacrifice. He is pleased with Noah's worship. But he is devoting. He is devoting. Listen, in the heart, that's where devotion is, right? In the heart, that's where our commitments are formed and forged and experienced. What do we devote to the Lord? What are we willing to give up for him? What are we willing to give to him? What are we willing to devote to the Lord? That's, a, that's an item settled in the heart. That's why when Jesus talks about offering, he says, you know what, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you willing to devote to him? And the other question, the other side of the coin is, what are you not willing to give to God? What are you not willing to devote to him? What do you insist on keeping for yourself? In the heart is devotion. Now think about Moses. 11 months in the ark with all these animals. And as much of a mess that must have been, and as much of a, of a trial that must have been, Noah could say, look, I've worked too hard <laughs> to keep these animals safe. And it's up to me, it's up to my responsibility, Noah could have said, to repopulate the globe. The, the, the survival of these animal species depends on what happens next. So what if some of it doesn't work out? What if some of the pairs don't mate very well? What if they don't have enough uh, 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 offspring? You know, we got to hold on to every single pair. I work too hard to keep them. <laughs> Instead, what does Noah do? He takes wood and he builds an altar. Now, now, let me ask you this. Where did Noah find dry wood? The ark. The ark itself, right? Taking wood from the very instrument of his salvation. And he builds this altar. And he could have said, you know what? I worked too hard to save those animals. I'm going to hold on to every last pair. But instead, what does he do? He takes some, some of the clean animals and he offers them up. You see, God provided for this. That's why God said to Noah, make sure that you take seven pairs of the clean animals. Take more than just one pair. Now, why is this happening? God is providing in Noah's present for his future and saying, Noah, I want you to lavishly devote things to me. And I'll provide for you now what you'll have the chance to give in the future. It's a measure of devotion, of the faith and trust. You know what? Because if someone had said, I mean, picture maybe one of Noah, maybe Noah's wife or one of his family saying, Noah, do you, you, you got to sacrifice all, I mean, should, may, maybe just do one. You know, because we're not sure if it's all going to work out yet. Shouldn't we have as many options as possible to make sure that this whole repopulation thing works? Why are you burning them up? Why are you just setting them on fire? Shouldn't we hold on to that? Because we just don't know what's going to happen. Could have said that, and maybe some of them did. But instead, Noah said no. Listen, this is God's thing. This is what God is doing. God has said he will repopulate the world. God has said it's creation 2.0. God has said it's the reset. He'll take care of it. He provided all these animals for us. Yeah, we're going to sacrifice. Could you see it as wasteful and extravagant? You could see it that way. But the truth is, it's all God's anyway. It came from him, it's going back to him, and as a way to show God that it is all his and that I know it, yeah. It's on the altar for God to use. And we're going to consume it. We're going to burn it up. Uh, th th this was a free will burnt offering. There was nothing left. You know, a little bit later when, when all of these details came through Moses, you would encounter some offerings that could be, a portion of it could be kept. There were some burnt offerings where you could keep aside a portion and maybe the priest could have a meal on it later. Some of that would happen later. But in Moses' day, or rather, in Noah's day, what is Noah doing? Every single ounce, every single part, everything on these is burnt up and sacrificed to the Lord. You know, Jesus encountered a man once that struggled with this. The Bible calls him the rich young ruler. But he comes to God and he's searching. You know, Jesus loved him. And, and, and I just believe Jesus wanted him so desperately to become a follower. 
And the man was obviously searching. He said, he said Lord, I'm doing all these things, but, but I'm still lacking something. What else can I do? And remember what Jesus said to him in Mark chapter 10. Jesus said, he said, this one thing you lack. Sell everything. Give to the poor, and then you come and follow me. Now, listen, Jesus knew this man's heart, and he knew that this man was holding on to his riches. He was holding on to his wealth. And what does the Bible say? One of the saddest, saddest verses in all of Scripture is in Mark chapter 10 when Mark simply says, the rich young ruler turned away. He walked away from Jesus. And then Mark gives us the explanation. Because he had much wealth. Folks, that's heartbreaking because here is a man who knew what he should do and Jesus laid that decision in his hands. What will you do? Jesus loved him. He wanted him to become a follower. But this man wasn't willing to devote everything into God's hands. When you and I gather for worship and what does it reveal about our hearts, folks, whenever we approach this idea of making an offering, what are we not willing to give? What are we not willing to devote? What are we not willing to put into God's hands? And we might even say, you know what? I worked too hard to get that. I sacrificed to keep that safe, and you're telling me to give it up? Why should I devote things and not know what God will do with them? It might get messed up. It might get broken. I'm going to hold on to it because I don't know about the future. God is saying, devote everything. That's what worship reveals about your heart. And then finally, we'll put up that last point. What does worship reveal about our hearts? It also reveals the depth of our relationship with God. And this, this, is, this is the deepest part of the story. Now, I want to look at it with you very carefully. Again, Noah chapter 8. He offers up his worship, and he offers up this sacrifice, right? And I want you to think especially about the effect that this sacrifice has. This is very important. Verse 21, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said where? In his heart, and I love this. We, folks, how often do we get to eavesdrop into the conversations that God has with his own heart? But we see it here in Genesis 8. He says, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. I love verse 22. While the earth remains, while we still have a world, this is God's promise to you and me. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. But how did this, why did this happen? Why did God respond in this way? Because of one man. One man and his sacrifice. Because of one man and his sacrifice, the heart of God is moved. Because of one man and his sacrifice, the heart of God is changed. But listen, notice what God is saying. He's saying, you know what? I don't think it's going to be a whole lot different. Before the flood, every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. After the flood, it's not going to change. But this one man, sacrificed and so now my heart has changed because Noah did this because this was the depth of his relationship with God because of one man because of one man the sun came up today because of one man the seasons change because of one man seed time and harvest because of one man and his sacrifice. You see, when Noah worshiped, God responds, and God does, and God acts, and the very heart of God is moved. Folks, it's not too much to claim that one man's sacrifice changed how God dealt with the world, because what does the Bible tell us happened when Jesus gave his life on the cross? Romans chapter 3 says that God put him forward as a sacrifice of atonement in an even deeper way than Noah could have experienced because of one man's sacrifice. Our sins are forgiven. Because of one man's sacrifice, 
The heart of God has been changed and moved. And we are blessed because of it. That's relationship. And, and folks, that's the heart, right? It's from the heart that we find relationships begun and forged and strengthened and vouchsafed and preserved and cultivated. It's a heart thing. And this is what we see expressed with Noah and his worship. Folks, as I mentioned a moment ago, worship is so much more than something that we schedule on the church calendar. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, listen, listen to these words. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, for this is your spiritual acceptable act of worship. And don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you'll be able to live out exactly the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And I want to ask you today, what is worship revealed about your heart? The, the very act of coming here and worshiping together, what is it revealed about your heart today? What is it revealed about your love of simply doing something spontaneously for God because, not because you have to, because you want to? What is it revealed about your devotion, all that you are willing to give up and over to him? And what is it revealed about your relationship? One man's sacrifice makes your relationship with God possible. And even today, you can trust one man and what he gave for you. And he offered up a sacrifice not on an ark, but upon a cross. One man for you, one man for all. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for Noah and what he did. The one chance he had to do something, not because you told him to, he simply did it because he wanted to. And Father, I have to say to you that I stand convicted today because if I think about being cooped up in an ark for 11 months, when I got the chance to, to, to get out of that and get away from that, would I, would the first thing I do would be to stop and build you an altar and worship? God, i got to confess that to you and understand what this has revealed about my heart today. So, Father, I pray that by your Spirit you would help all of us to come into your presence, sense your forgiveness, sense your love. It's love that is free, but it's love that cost Jesus. And that because of one man's sacrifice, not only is it seed time and harvest, sun and moon, day and night, but even more than that, because of one man's sacrifice, we have our sins forgiven, we live for you forever, and with the dawning of each new day, we build upon that blessing with this blessing to say with each new day, we can say, dear Father, in light of the mercies of Christ, I offer my life to you today. Take it, God, and use it, because I love you that much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.